Okuma Media's Polity Mtabi Madiba, author and journalist Mark Kavisa, joins me to discuss his book titled Tabo Mbeki, The Dream Deferred. Your 2007 book, The Dream Deferred, provided a detailed profile of former South African President Thabo Mbeki and the period of his leadership. So what inspired you to update the book so many years later? You know, Tabi, a lot of it came from readers themselves. Uh, I've been fascinated by the way my book has continued to appeal, particularly to, um, well, to, to many South Africans, but particularly to, to younger Black professionals and intellectuals for whom Mbeki, I think, is very, very significant. And we can talk about why that is. And, and, and I was getting letters from many readers saying, you know, this is great, thank you, but what happened after 2007? Or, or we know what happened after 2007, but we want to hear your take on it. So it was a combination of that and also uh, that on the one hand, and on, and, and on the other hand, the fact that Mbeki was... Um, becoming active in public life again. After 2017, he was having more of a profile again. And I wanted to understand that. I also felt there had been enough time since the book had been published and since he had been president to really be able to assess his legacy with some hindsight, rather than uh, writing from the heat of the battle, which is when I published the first edition in 2007, just before the leadership battle with with Jacob Zuma and Paulo Kwame. And what issues involving Mbeki do you focus on in the new chapters that you have brought into your updated edition? Well, I have a new, uh, an extensive new introduction and a new epilogue. And in the introduction, uh, what I look at is what Tabo Mbeki has been doing since he was ousted in 2007, 2008. How he first turned his attention elsewhere because uh, very hurt and very damaged politically and personally. He, he kind of absented himself from South African public life. But, but even though we have this idea that he disappeared, uh, he was not just sitting um, at home in Rivera in his home kind of stewing. He was incredibly busy and active doing things on the African continent. So I look at that. I also look at um, the role he, he's played in South African politics since he became active again in 2017, 2018. Uh, That's what I do in the introduction. Um, And then in the epilogue, I assess his presidency and I very importantly ask a question, which I know we're gonna be talking about. I ask the question, did Thabo Mbeki lay the table for state capture? What was it in Thabo Mbeki's era that made state capture possible in Zuma's era? is a question I ask. So that's the new material in the book. I also, because because of the way time has passed, I I have a lot more information about what happened at Pulukwani. And so I substantially revised that chapter too. And after Mbeki was ousted by Jacob Zuma, he refused to campaign for the ANC under Zuma's leadership. So what do you make of his more prominent political role under President Sarah Ramaphosa? Yeah, I mean, he refused to campaign in a very um, uh, assertive way. He said, in fact, and he wrote this, he wrote a letter to Jacob Zuma, which he leaked to the public, in which he said, I refuse to rule from beyond the grave. Between the years of 2007, 2008, when he was ousted from the presidency, and 2017, we heard nothing from Tabo Mbeki about um about ANC politics and South African politics. In 2017, he was persuaded by other elders in the party to become part of the movement to deal with the crisis that was facing them in the leadership battle. The crisis being Jacob Zuma and the fact that Zuma's proxies were, were, um, were running for power under this radical economic transformation ticket and that the ANC needed to renew itself and upgrade itself in some way and, and get rid of the Zuma legacy. And, and Mbeki was persuaded to become part of that. And he, he gave the sort of keynote address at a 2017 conference, um, crisis conference called by ANC veterans. Um, then once uh, Cyril Ramaphosa was elected president of the ANC, Tabo Mbeki decided he could come back into the ANC. Um, and he decided that he would actively um, support Cyril Ramaphosa in in the next election, um, in in the next national election. 
and that he would play a role within the African National Congress as an elder statesman. And, and the way he explains it is, is that he felt that once Jacob Zuma and his negative influence had been expunged from the party, um, there was evidence that the party was renewing itself again, and therefore he could be part of that. I think that's the political reason. I think the personal reason is, is that he was so hurt and damaged uh, by his ousting that once the people who ousted him were no longer in power in the same way, he could come back again. There's some complexity there because one of the key people who ousted him was in fact Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, in fact, at the meeting, at the ANC-NEC meeting in 2008, that decided to recall um, Thabo Mbeki. It was Ramaphosa who led the charge. And to me, that's really interesting because Mbeki has said repeatedly about the Zuma era, this is not the ANC. He has taken the, um, the view, he has given the analysis that the ANC was captured by corrupt outsiders and that that was those corrupt outsiders who expelled him and who then um, got involved with state capture. But, but when you look at the people who expelled them and how they are now, how some of them are now, are, are still in government now and are his allies now, or, or that he believes are renewing the party, you see that it's far more complicated than that very polarized um, good and bad, good people and bad people, um, schema that Mbeki um, likes to uh, uh, describe. And Mbeki warned during ANC Deputy Secretary General Desi Duarte's memorial service last month that the ANC had failed to effectively deal with issues around its renewal, as well as unemployment, poverty and inequality, which he said continued to haunt the country. So what do you think he adopted such a critical tone at this time? Well, let's go, let's go back historically to Thabo Mbeki. My book is called The Dream Deferred. And it comes from a, a Langston Hughes poem that Mbeki loves. What happens to the dream deferred? Does it explode? And ever since um, Mbeki was deputy president in the mid 1990s, he has been haunted by this vision of the dream of South African liberation exploding into violence, into chaos, because it is being deferred, because it is not being met. He has often articulated that view over the last 25, 30 years. Now he has felt the need to articulate it very powerfully in the last few weeks at J.C. Duarte's funeral. And I think it's for two reasons. I think it's because we are seeing uh, a gathering crisis. Uh, really, um, since the riots and upheavals of last year um, in KwaZulu-Natal, and then into the economic recession we're, we're facing now and the unemployment um, that, that, that is rising and, and the inflation that is rising. So we, we have a crisis um, uh, that, that's sort of unprecedented. And I think he's responding rationally to that. He's also, I, I think, um, deeply disappointed in um, the Ramaphosa government's uh, inability to, to handle the issues that um, it is faced with. And, and I think that this comes in his case uh, from a position of personal disappointment because he has been advising Ramaphosa and the Ramaphosa government um, in, in, in quite an active way. And, and, and it seems that he feels he hasn't been listened to. So he's angry about that. And I think we're hearing a little bit of anger about that in, um, what he said at Jesse Duarte's funeral. There's also a, a part of Tabo Mbeki that's always been there. It's one of the reasons why he was ousted is, is that, that he always believes he knows better than everybody. And maybe he does in some instances. So I think he's been able to contain that for many years, but it's, it's kind of burst out again. You're not doing your job properly. I can do it better. Uh, that's, the, that's the sort of, I think, a little bit of the tone in that speech at Jesse Duarte's funeral. That being said, I think it's really important that he is using his platform as an ex-president to do what I call truth-telling um, when he sees things going wrong because 
It is true that the Ramaphosa administration is not grappling effectively with the problems we're facing. And Mark, do you think that um, Becky's rational evidence-based approach to policy making made him a better president than any other of the post-apartheid presidents of the country? I think it's complicated. I, I think that we have a lot of what I call in Becky stalgia at the moment for what you have just described as, as, as rational and evidence-based government. I mean, in many respects, um, uh, particularly when it came to economic policy, uh, we saw that rational evidence-based approach. But let's not forget as well that Thabo Mbeki was an, is an AIDS denialist who, whose policies around HIV and AIDS caused immense harm to the country, to the ANC, and to his own profile, where his, his rational evidence-based approach became inflected with or infected by ideology and specifically race-based ideologies. So Mbeki quite correctly saw the ways that um, the pharmaceutical industry, that the countries of the global north, uh, that many epidemiologists were dealing with Africa and Africans and African sexuality in a racist way. All of that is true. All of that is true. Uh, rational and evidence-based. But where Mbeki strayed from the path of evidence-based reason is he, he moved from there to um, concluding uh, that there were problems with the science itself and uh, that HIV does not cause AIDS and that antiretrovirals um, are, are dangerous and poisonous rather than, as we know, as we can see, as is evidenced, life-saving and, and society-saving too. So I think there's, an, there's a clear example of, of um, the complexity to the way Mbeki reasons or, the, or, the, or the, the, the deficits in the way that Mbeki reasons. Talk to us more on Mbeki's use of racialized political rhetoric to differentiate himself from the national reconciliation which characterized Nelson Mandela's tenure? So one of the things, uh, Tabi, I write in my, in my new introduction is, is that um, the latest political generation, uh, what we might call the fallest generation, fees must fall, roads must fall, are very much Tabo and Becky's ideological children. And I say this for two reasons. I say this firstly because um, they are the beneficiaries of Black economic empowerment, which was the signature policy of the Mbeki era. But, but also I say this because Mbeki started speaking about uh, the importance of decolonization and the importance of, of, of Black empowerment, not just economically, but intellectually, right from the beginning. And a lot of that was tied into the way that he saw um, how white South Africans and white people all over the world were dealing with Mandela. Everybody loved Mandela. Mandela was the great reconciler. He was this fuzzy grandfather. And white people, and Becky said, this is a direct quote from Becky, white people tend, tended to see Mandela as the one good native. He is the one good black man. He is the person who's going to save this country. And if power goes to any other black people, we're going to go to, the, to hell in a handbasket like the rest of Africa. That was the white racist attitude that Mbeki came up against again and again. And particularly when Mbeki started speaking about the importance uh, for economic empowerment, once there was political empowerment, he saw a lot of pushback, particularly from established white businesses. And, and, and he felt that as soon as white people were being asked to actually give something up, they responded with racism. And they responded to a personal racism towards him that they did not exhibit towards Mandela. And, and this um, sharpened his understanding of the racism in South African society and among white South Africans. Once more, I think that was rational and evidence-based but it had some applications that were corrosive, that um, 
were really not good for South African politics. One I've already discussed, with, which is AIDS. Another was the way that Mbeki attacked the media, which he saw as representative of white interests. And therefore, any black journalist who, um, who criticized Mbeki, and there were many, he um, dismissed as Uncle Tom's, as people doing the white man's business for them. He wasn't able to hear that the critique was actually often genuine and spot on and came from a perspective of, um, of, 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 of black South Africans feeling that Mbeki was not doing his job properly. And Mbeki has come out strongly against Zuma state capture and corruption, yet you said that the Mbeki presidency and the Mbeki-led ANC have set the table for state capture. So why do you make this assertion? Well, you know, I said at the beginning of this that Tabo Mbeki likes to divide um, the movement into um, good people who aren't corrupt who, and, and bad people who, are, who have captured the ANC and are corrupt. And, and it's very clear that there's a continuum that this, that this isn't accurate, historically inaccurate. And there are many, many ways I argue that Tabo Mbeki set the table for state capture. Let's say at the outset though, that there is no evidence, there never has been, and God knows Zuma's people have tried to find this evidence, but they failed. There is no evidence that Tabo Mbeki himself is personally corrupt. But how did he set the table for state capture? Firstly, by wanting to cling on to power in the way he wanted to cling on to power, which opened the door for the Jacob Zuma movement, the tsunami, right? That's the first way. And the very particular way that Tabo Mbeki governed, which was this very alienated, quite elitist way, that allowed this populist Jacob Zuma to come up as a sort of counter and Becky. So that's the first way. But secondly, in terms of policies and practices, in, in the policies and practices of patronage and particularly cater deployment that came about during the Mbeki era, you know, um, I, I used the, a phrase that was coined by, by Ivor Chutkin and Mark Swilling, which is the Mbeki era was an era of political capture and the Zuma era was an era of institutional capture. And the political capture of the Mbegi era opened the door for the institutional capture of the Zuma era. By political capture, what I mean is cater deployment, putting ANC people everywhere, uh, valuing loyalty to the party over efficiency, over meritocracy, over the ability to run the state well or the city well, uh, or the province well. And we see today the deleterious effects of that. Now, Black economic empowerment in and of itself, I do not believe, uh, Moeletsi Mbeki, Tabo's brother, says uh, powerfully that as soon as you have a system uh, where people um, make money because of who they know rather than what they know, it's ripe for corruption. And Mweletsi uses this as a way of dismissing the whole project of Black economic empowerment. I, 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 don't, I don't ascribe to that. I think that Black economic empowerment has been an absolutely essential um, growth driver of, 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 of South African society and the economy. Um, but there are particular ways it was implemented in the Mbeki era, which is, is that we put people in positions um, of power in the private sector and they then fund the ANC. A corrupt system develops there. And, and the clearest example of this that I can give, I mean, there are many examples, but the clearest example I can give of this is what we're seeing with ESCOM today. Now, if you ask um, uh, the, the executives at ESCOM uh, or even Previn Gordon, the minister, what the biggest problem with ESCOM is, uh, in high up on the list is the, are these defective boilers that are at, at Kusili and Medupi. Now these boilers were supplied by Hitachi through a deal with Chancellor House. Chancellor House is the ANC's investment vehicle. All of this happened in Mbeki's time. When that deal was made, was ESCOM thinking of our energy needs as a country or was it thinking about the ANC's bank balance? Unfortunately, the answer is as much the latter or maybe more of the latter than the former. And hence we find ourselves in the situation we're in today. Now I'm oversimplifying greatly, 
but 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 I'm trying to to give an example, a, a, a concrete example, of how the political capture, uh, the attempted political capture of the state and of the economy in the Mbeki era leads to the institutional capture and the kleptocracy of the Zuma era. And lastly, Mark, you argue that in general, much of Mbeki's truth telling has gone underreported. So why do you mean by this? And why do you think this has happened? Well, you know, okay. We all know what Mbeki said at Jesse Duarte's funeral. And it is true. He said it more strongly than he said it before. But he's been saying it. If you go back and you look at what Mbeki's been saying in the last two or three years, he's been saying it. He said it at a ANC, NEC meetings that, that have been put into the public domain. He said it at ANC campaign meetings, even in the local government elections. It's been said. And, and it's very interesting that we're not hearing it. And I'm, I'm interested in that. And I think it's partly because of the way Mbeki has been consigned in the public imagination to a place of nostalgia or anger. We all have vested interests in seeing him either as the great president who was replaced by this terrible kleptocracy of Zuma or as this terrible president who was the AIDS dissident and the racist and all of these things. And so we're, I, we see him in one of those two ways and it's hard for us to focus on him in the present because we have so much vested in, in how we remember him. It's partly that and it's partly what I find quite astonishing, which how bad Mbeki and his foundation is at publicizing him. It's almost as if they're saying to the ANC and to South Africa, you banished me, so I'm not making any effort to be heard by you anymore. I'm going to say what I have to say. I'm going to go on doing what I'm doing. And if your cameras happen to be focused on me, then that's great. But I'm not publicizing myself in any way because I got burnt once and, and I'm not going to be burnt again. So I find it absolutely astonishing how badly the Tabo Mbeki Foundation publicizes what Mbeki says. It's impossible to find. Last I looked, their website wasn't working. Um, it's all just done on Facebook. I mean, not so many people use Facebook anymore. Uh, they use other social media more. It, it's, it's interesting to me that there seems to be very little interest from Tabo Mbeki in having that public profile. And, and, and maybe that's changing now with the Jesse Duarte speech. Maybe we're going to see it more coming up. That was Mark Gavisa speaking to Krima Media's policy about Tabo Mbeki, the dream deferred.